welcome to the Varm Blog, and today we continue our series of nailing it down on the viable systems model, and we end with systems two and one are the horizontal systems, right? Now, systems one in the whole system, let me flash up the diagram that can be a little bit opaque from uh, designing the system. We can see here. A multiple systems one. All right, we can see here, for example, one and two are an embedded horizontal feedback loops because you have different activities that a system has to do, just like you have different organs, you know, and a body, and you have different regulatory systems for that. Now, if we think of systems three and for as the administration and program apparatus or the actual how you implement your research program, how you structure your department, how you administer it. Systems two is the coordination. How do the parts of system one are the different system ones within a larger system interact with each other? How do you, uh, to use an example that Kyle Thomas used, if you're picking carrots in a garden and you need to get them to the kitchen, how do you know how to do that? If you wait for management and the vertically aligned systems to act all the time, you're going to have a very slow and unresponsive system. For the more system one needs internal intervention checks, not just waiting for systems four or systems three to intervene on it. You need to be able to check yourself to look at if you're regulating and if you are actually fulfilling the way you understand your praxis, your informed activity from the mission of the organ of the system to function. All right. And if it steps out of line, one of the other systems usually has to get involved if no one self corrects. System two is a pain point. It's where thinking horizontally really gets bogged down. If we let systems three and four overstep their bounds and integrate everything and logistics they're going to micromanage they're going to probably set up oligarchical carteling and the system is going to be both slow and highly dependent on leadership which will be able to use that additional power to maintain itself within the system at the expense of the system's larger ethos or its immediate functioning all right we can see this happening in all kinds of places, like systems, as I mentioned before, systems three and four is where things can bloat and where things can come really unbalanced. But also, if there's no horizontal thinking in system two, no coordination, you don't have any cohesion and you don't have a system, all right? You have an aggregate, not a collective, once again. So this is very important to understand. So one, systems three will need to audit system one and occasionally when system breaks an intervention rule. And intervention rules are agreed upon by all parts of the system and it triggers an audit. So someone basically doesn't do what they say they're going to do and you need to make sure that the audit works. Now, the thing about this is in a lot of systems that are overly oriented top down, uh, the audit only goes one way. We don't, we don't change praxis because practice isn't followed, right? Um, we punish people for not following it. But what if praxis and the rules outlining praxis are stupid? What if they're overregulated? What if they're inefficient? Uh, what if they prohibit coordination? What should you do? Well, the audit should actually pick up on changes to the entire system, not just punish the system one. That is what a responsive, fairly egalitarian system will do versus a very top-down system, which will try to prescribe everything in a pyramidal hierarchy. You will notice that beer does not draw this like a pyramid. It is a flow chart. All right. So every participator in a system needs to agree on what the breaking points are that are going to trigger an audit and agree on what the checks are and who can act as the role of system three. Because remember also, if we're trying to make relatively egalitarian 
uh, situations, we're going to want a system three that is probably not localized in people, but in roles. And so we might need people to change out who are in those roles on a regular, regular basis. So they can't use their power in, in the auditing and um, implementation to curtail things and capture parts of the system. Because remember, systems three and four is where this is most open and viable to happen. Now, you can think about this in other ways. So the end of the series is to think, okay, well, I used a framework provided by Cal Thompson, which tries to give these a name. System one is activity. I often call that practice. System two is coordination, horizontal coordination coordination between different kinds of activity sectors. System three is the auditing and coherence. So what actually maintains the functioning? What is the program? How do you implement? What are your tactical goals? And how do you check and make sure that the practice works? Are you doing something that is productive? Are there ways to make sure the coordination is happening? Do you always rely on systems three and four for that coordination? Or can you do it in systems two and then self-check in system one? Lastly, is all this aligned with the ethos and mission of the organization? If any of these things break down, you have a lack of cohesion. Now, this is a very abstract way of talking about it because it is a very abstract way of being. If you think of it this way, you could, you could, you could label this differently. System one would be praxis, as I've been labeling it. Systems two would be um, horizontal implementation. Systems three would be oversight and ideological coherence. System four would be programs and strategic orientation. And systems five would be the principles of the organization. All right. But you could also think of system five as the, the brain of the firm or the, the party of the state or whatever. You know, system five can be an ethos and it can be a mission. And it will define everything else. But if Systems 5 doesn't have an ethos, largely other forms of authority will establish it. Right. So we can pull from Weber here or from any other number of sociological thinkers to see the kinds of authority that could manifest in System 5 if it doesn't have a clear mission. All right. These missionless organizations are often what we think of as having cult-like behavior. They are bounded to personalities and figures, not to any other purpose. And sometimes the figure's only purpose is to maintain their role as the head of System 5. That is a dysfunctional system, at least if the system wishes to achieve anything beyond its own self-cohesion on charismatic terms. All right? So there's all kinds of ways you can reconceive these system levels. You could think of system one as, as praxis, system two as tactics, system three as theory, you know, or theory, system four as strategy or higher theory, and system five is principles again, or axioms or ideology. There are many ways you can set this up, depending on whether or not you think your system is a system of knowledge production or a system of social production. Knowledge production can be more abstract and more informal. Social production usually has to have people doing specific things in a collective action so that the collective action appears as if it can operate with collective agency. Individuals still have a huge play, and really, individual agency is the dominant thing. But we can think of something like a system that allows for something like emergent decision-making within the system as a whole, right? the collective as a whole. Etc. Um, we're going to go into more with uh, cybernetics. Uh, so I'm going to come back into this. You can also see the kinds of pitfalls that you can have in designing systems. This says nothing about uh, fragility, flexibility of a system. It says nothing about the efficiency of a system. These are just viable systems, but you can make viable systems that are inefficient or efficient. You can make viable systems that are flexible or inflexible. Inflexible systems are given to cascade, cascade failure. So if something falls down, everything falls down. This happens in highly centralized systems, but also highly authoritarian leaders. It's the irony of simplification through authoritarianism 
that Joseph Tainter talks about in his book, the, the Rise and Collapse of Complex Societies, where overly complicated societies will appeal to a singular leader as a form of simplification, but also in doing so uh, relies on some form of extra systemic authority. And this tends to weaken all the other sectors within the system, but in increase in competition between different sectors within the system, vying for the attention of the, of the, of the authoritarian point in the system in which tends to lead to its collapse unless there's an outside th stressor such as war or sanctions or ethnic tension which kind of focuses as a counterforce to collapse but that won't last forever and the moment that's gone things tend to fall apart this is why highly charismatic um uh, you know single leader structures tend to be really fragile um is because all it takes is for the is for that main figure to just have natural entropy hit them and they die or become incapacitated or mentally unbalanced and there you go all right so i want you to think about other kinds of systems thinking that you can under overlay on viable systems model to understand this notice that i've also Im implied that this can be authoritarian or democratic right there's nothing inherently to this form. You might want uh, the a hyper-authoritarian one of these is going to be super fragile. A hyper-democratic one needs a really strong ethos. And it needs to be materially incentivized to maintain itself. Otherwise, it's going to lose cohesion. And the reason why has to do with other cybernetic principle rules, and we'll get to them later. So where you might impose this on you know marxist political theory you might impose this on anarchist political theory you might impose this on management theory which is how it's commonly done uh you might use ecology and complexity theory to see the the, the other ways to optimize this viable systems model all right because it's a fairly values neutral system model it's optimized for a, uh, for a few key things but you can take it in a bunch of different directions i mean beer used this as part of his operation with Cydersons to coordinate the Cordones in Chile to actually make a functional economy that maybe could run even without currency, although it never got the chance to. All right. And this was to break up bureaucratic functionings and turn bureaucratic functionings and skills capture into provisional roles through information sharing in this systems model. But as most businesses are not remotely democratic they tend to be autocratic and they still use a lot of the same ideascape you can see that it can go in any direction all right like and subscribe hit the bell thank you so much for your support i've had i've been having a rough year this year and you guys have really helped me out um you can subscribe on the patreon you can subscribe for free on the bus sprout podcast to get the interviews um or you can just stay here and subscribe. Please share and review uh, and make comments. That's actually more important for my uh, algorithm because I'm not a monetized podcast. Have a great day.